Good morning. How are you doing? Well, we're so glad. My wife and I are very glad to be back with you. Uh, yeah, I'm hoping my vo voice will last out. We've been fighting ragweed for the past couple of three weeks. But uh, Lord willing, we'll, we'll make it through. But if you think about it as we're going through here, lift me up in prayer. Uh, Open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Ephesians. We're going to do a study in there as time permits. Woo! Yeah, time permits. 22. Okay. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> it's her fault. All complaints. Okay. I'll, I'll try to <laughs> adjust as we go along. Uh, I love the book of Ephesians. I'm involved in a, a men's study right now that's going through Ephesians. Ephesians is one of my favorite books. I guess the gospel, I can't say one's better than the other, but endearing to me is the gospel of John and the book of Ephesians. And, and like I said, I'm going through a study right now on that. And uh, this music right here really helped because you might see some of that in here. And uh, it, it's just a tremendous book. It's, uh, I call it the, the Ephesians is the believer's boot camp, uh, the cliff notes on the Bible. Every major doctrine that you can think of is at least implied in the book of Ephesians. It's, it's tremendous. So I'm kind of full of it this morning just after studying it and been studying it now for several weeks. And like I said, I've been studying Ephesians forever, but being back involved in that. So when you go home today and people can say, well, how is that preacher from San Antonio today? You can say, well, he's full of it. And I'll say, amen. That's right. Thank you. My wife's been telling people for 30 years I'm full of it. So anyway... I'm glad to be with you again, and uh, got to have my review. Uh, I did it last time. It's going to be a habit of mine. Uh, some of you are new faces that I didn't see you last time I was here, so you're excused. But I remember some of your faces. A review. Brother Frank talked about the spreading of the gospel. What is the gospel? Good news. Amen. What else? It's the good news. The word gospel means the good news. It is the good news. But what is the good news? Jesus died for all our sins. All the sins of everybody. Amen. How Messiah died for our sins. According to the scriptures. And that he buried and rose again on the third day. According to the scriptures. That is the gospel. That is the power that saves. Is that he died for our sins according to the scriptures. Uh, all right, let's get to the study here. Okay. Highlight a few things before we get into it. In the, we're going to go through verse 1 through 6 of Ephesians and a couple more out of chapter 3. But it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Does everybody know who Paul is? Okay? Now, we see Paul here. And that's an int it kind of tells us a whole lot about the person just in his name if you do some study on that. Paul is the Greek rendering of a Latin name. Paul was born in the city of Tarsus, which was a Greek city under Roman rule. And so he's, we're, we see him here as Paul. Do you know what Jesus called him? Saul. What? Saul. 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 We find that in our Bibles. And uh, you'll find that in Acts chapter 26. It's Saul. Saul. When Paul was a religious fanatic in the Jewish religion. I mean, he was, it'd be like saying he graduated from Harvard with honors. He was so educated in the Jewish religion. And in it, he was so zealous, he thought it advantageous to him in the kingdom of God if he would persecute Christians. And that's what he was about doing. He had gotten papers so he could go to Damascus and do it again and get some more of them and persecute them, throw them in jail, whatever it took. They stamp out that Christian movement. But like the song, but God. 
God stopped him on that road to Damascus, knocked him to his knees, called him to salvation, and placed him in the ministry. But God, that's Paul, or Saul. It says he's an apostle. What's an apostle? Try again. Okay, it is. It is a person that walks with God. The word literally means one sent with a message. Okay? So, in essence, all believers are apostles, but with a little a. The office of apostleship was restricted just a few people. They had to be personal eyewitnesses of the Messiah. Who can qualify that to, for that today? Nobody. So the capital A, apostle, is no longer existence. The little a, we're all messengers uh, of God. Or an ambassador, that would even be a better, uh, a better word maybe to use. One sent with a message from the leader of a dominion. Okay, well, let's read it. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. It wasn't Paul's will. He didn't survey the different job opportunities and say, well, that might be a good thing to do. God's will stopped him on that road, knocked him to his knees, made him literally helpless, and called him into the ministry at that time by God's will. To the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. What's a saint? Anyone who's saved. Thank you. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he has chosen us in him. Now remember this. Before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now, chapter 3, and verse 7. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints in this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus. If you need a title for a lesson, you can say before the foundation of the world or the eternal purpose of God. I want us to notice back up there, I made a little emphasis on it in uh, verse For according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy with blame. Who did the choosing? And when did he do this? Before the foundation of the world. That, that phrase kind of captured my attention a couple weeks back and I've been kind of thinking about that and pondering on it. And uh, there's not a whole lot in the Bible about it, but there is some. There are some things that that are taught about it. And what I want us to get from this, in case I lose track and forget, I'm, I'll be mindful of the clock here and, <laughs> and be worried about that. But if, in case I forget, I want us to remember three things about this message today. There is a God. He has a plan. And you're in it. Okay? Very basic, very simple. There is a God. He has a plan. And you're in it. But first, let's talk about this God. There is a God. It's mentioned up here in the first part of it, where he acknowledges God's will and his being an, a, an apostle of Jesus Christ. How many of you here believe in God this morning? Amen. Just about every hand raised. Which God do you believe in? What's his name? 
wow, that's impressive. We had a little precursor here in the Sunday school. But his name is Yahweh. That's a necessary thing to know and to understand. Why? Number one, because it's in the book. It's in the book. More than 6,728 times in the Old Testament alone. Moses asked God at the burning bush, Whom shall I say sent me? He tell him, I am sent you. Yahweh. That's indicated in most of your translations as all capital letters. That gives us an identity to attach to our God. It's not just any God. There are many different things that have been claimed to be God. They each one and every one have a name. The name of my God is Yahweh. It's the God of, he is the God of the Bible. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of Frank. <laughs> and his name is Yahweh. Eternal, existing Yahweh. And he has revealed himself to us. Most concepts of any type of God is if there is a God, he's off into the distance and has nothing to do with us. No concern for us. Our God has an interest in us. He has gone to great extremes to make himself known to us, in particularly through his word and through his son. He desires to have fellowship and intimacy with us. And he has progressively revealed different things about him so that we can know so much about him. We can't know everything about him. He's God. But he has revealed to us many things about himself. Beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. What does that say? In the beginning, in the beginning what? Did what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Who did it? Does anybody know what that word God is there? Elohim. No, you're probably all familiar that heard it. It's the same word that you'll see elsewhere in the gods, gods plural of Egypt. Or the false gods of uh, the Gentiles. It's plural. That word is plural. That little H-I-M sound on the end of it indicates that that word God is plural. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning. One God, the Shema that the, the Jewish people pray every morning and every night. Behold, O Israel, our God is one God. But in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Him, Elo. Him. And you go down a little bit further. What does it say about man? Let us make man in our image. Wow! Right there in the first book of the Bible, we find out something about this one God in a plural personalities. Of course, we now know, or at least most of us do know, from any kind of study in the Bible, in fundamental Christian groups, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. <coughs> but there was a time, mentioned there in Ephesians 1, we've got a grasp of the creation forward, but there was a time before the foundation of the world, before things were created, when it was just God. Think about that. <laughs> And if it doesn't fry your brain, think about it a little bit more. Because that's just a concept for me to, I can't hardly grasp. I mean, we don't know a whole bunch and we should not venture to make suggestions. But there are some things that the Bible uh, says about that time period. In John chapter 17 verse 5, Jesus in this, this in great intercessory prayer before the, uh, the day of the crucifixion that night he, in the garden, he was making this... Oh, wasn't quite in the garden yet, but he made this prayer. Mentioning the love which they shared before the world began. So whatever it was and whatever way it existed, they existed in love. 
Now, not the kind of the concept of love that we have today, all this uh, warm, fuzzy feeling stuff. Mutual admiration, adoration, self-sacrifice for the other. They were equal. That'll be important in just a second if I can get that far. They were equal. There wasn't one big God and two lesser gods. They were equal. All God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Equal. Equal. And it also says in John 17 as well, uh, the Messiah prays to be returned into the glory in which they shared when? Before the foundation of the world. Now, I don't have a complete grasp of that term glory, but I do know this. It has something to do with all the attributes of what God is intrinsically. Intrinsically. And we are introduced to it many times throughout the Bible as a brilliant, shining light. The theological term that everybody uses is the Shekinah glory. It's what knocked Paul to his knees that day. It was the glory. There was a time in the Messiah's ministry, he took three of the disciples up on the mountain and he transformed before them. And he says, in his clothes and his face, shined as the sun. That's, we are introduced to, to, to our little finite minds to comprehend something about this eternal, omnipotent, all-powerful God of the universe for our little minds to, to grab hold of. So whatever that is in that glory, it was in love and in glory, God, for however long. There is a God. He is eternal. He has always existed. He always will. And we find out something else about him. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then we jump over to the New Testament. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse three, 1 through 3. We find that in the beginning was the Word. And the word was, ah, 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 don't get ahead of yourself. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word now was God. Word, God, and was God. We just talked about it. There's only one God, but here we see the word was God. But then what does verse 14 tell us? To maybe help clarify our thinking. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. As of the only begotten of the father. Full of, we sang about it, grace and truth. We saw in him. Hebrews tells us that he is the very express image of the invisible God. What does God look like? He's invisible. But in the sun, we see the express image of him. So it's not his appearance, how tall he was, the color of his eyes, his hair, or anything like that. It's the characteristics and qualities and attributes of God that were exhibited in his life. God existed for eternity. There was a beginning of time. There will be an ending of time, and we'll move back into eternity. A young lady was kind of asking me about that a while ago. Are we living in the end times? And the Bible says, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't mean there's, not, there's going to be a time when nothing exists. There will continue to exist things, but it will not be in a measured time. That was begin on one time, it will end in another time. And we will continue on in an eternity with him. But that God that existed in eternity, in glory, in love, became man and dwelt among us. That's my God. That's my God. That's the one I worship. That's the God that cares about me, knows the number of hairs on my head, and he doesn't have to count so much as he used to. But he knows them. He knows my every thought, the every intention of my heart, and he knows yours too. And he knows everything about you. There's a book with all that stuff written in it, apparently. 
Every sin that you've ever committed, there's a record of it. But by faith in Jesus Christ, what happens to that? Blot it out. And he remembers your sin no more. There is now no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Believe me, if you read my book, you'd be really said that picture. Amen. Amen. Okay, so that's my God. And he has a plan mentioned up there in chapter 3 of Ephesians that we read, his eternal purpose. There are other scriptures that you can read uh, that say something about that. Second uh, Timothy 1, 9 said, He called us and saved us, not according to works, but according to his own purpose and grace. And I like this one here. Titus 1, 2. The hope of eternal life that I was just talking about. God promised before the world began. Who did he promise it to? God. <laughs> Remember? Us. Let us make God. In Acts chapter uh, 2, verse 23, it's called the uh, determinate counsel. It may be different the different translations. But it says that Jesus was turned over by the, ter- the determinate counsel of God. And you go over to chapter 4, it talks about uh, Pilate and Herod and the Gentiles and the Jewish leaders and what they did to him. But it says that they did exactly what your hand and counsel determined. When was all this? In this eternal purpose and plan before the foundation. A lot of people think, I don't know how many, but some people think that, okay, God created the heavens and the earth, put man in the garden, and he goes, look what they're doing now. Oh my goodness, what am I going to... Deity number two, deity number three, you got any ideas what we can do about this? No. No. I don't understand this all. But I do understand this much. It was all within his plan. Evil was in his plan. Who made Satan? He did. Was he surprised when Satan stood up and said, I'm going to do this and I'm... Was he... What are you talking about? No. He knew it. If there was ever a second that he did not know everything that there is to know, he's not God. Omniscient. He knows everything. He knows the beginning and he knows the end and everything between and before and after. He knows it all. He has a plan. And we see there in Ephesians chapter 3, it evolved, involved him choosing before the foundation of the world. And we find in Revelations 13, 8, a statement, or a couple of statements there that I, I find quite interesting. Number one, the Lamb of God, worthy is your name. It says, He stood as a lamb slain from the very foundation of the world. What does that mean? Uh, reference back to this determinate council. What God in that council had determined is going to be. And I don't think that it took any amount of time for them to come up with some conclusions. It, it's identified as eternal. How long does something that is eternal exist? Eternally. <laughs> it is a plan from beyond my comprehension as God's mind, it was there. It's not something they had to conjure up or to figure or to plan. It was his plan. It involved that. So the declaration of his giving himself as a lamb and his re, uh, progressively revealing that in Scripture to us was in the plan before the foundation of the world. And he saw that God sees that 
lamb slain from the foundation of the world is a done deal. It's over. It's complete. Now, it didn't physically happen till much later. But in the mind of God, it's complete. So how could he choose anybody before the foundation of the world? The payment had been made in the mind of God. It was complete. And you know what he did besides choosing those people? He put their name in a book. Revelation 13, 8, Revelation 17, 8, those names that he chose here, he put in a book. What does that do for you? Does that do anything for you? Mine too. I'm glad I got my shoes over my socks so they'd be gone. When I comprehend that, because I'm going to tell you, sometimes I don't feel too good about myself. Okay? Sometimes, not so much anymore, but I do get them every now and then. But I, a long time ago, I had a bunch of them. When I stopped and just considered what a mess I was, like my sister was sharing here a while ago. What a mess I was. And even to some degree, what a mess I am now, because I still fail miserably every day. So that if it depended on me to keep me saved, guess what? It wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen. Not one day. Sometimes not one hour. <laughs> I don't know about you, but it was me. Sometimes not one hour. It's not me. The book of Jude says we are kept by the power of God. It's in his hands. And I read in Isaiah something else about this purpose of God that we've read just a little bit about. Here. We had not read a whole lot, but just a little bit about the purpose of God. It says, I am God... And there is no other. There's none like me. I have made a plan and a purpose. I will fulfill it. And ain't nobody going to stop me. It was, about tr it was true about the kingdoms that he lifted up and overturned. There's never, ever been one kingdom that was not in his plan. The frustrations, that I voiced my frustrations last time about the upcoming election. I still have them. <laughs> Whoever it is, Lord help us, will not be there unless God ordains it to be. There is no authority which is not ordained of God. Not now, not ever. He sets them up. Daniel chapter, he sets them up, and he takes them down. He told us what they were going to be centuries ago in the book of Daniel. This one's coming, then this one's coming, then this one's coming, and then in the very end, there's going to be these right here. And then my son's coming for the second time and going to set up an eternal kingdom that will never fall. It's going to happen just like that. He has a plan. It's an eternal plan. A plan agreed to and promised amongst the deity before the foundation of the world. And in that plan, it required something of two members of the deity that's just, wow. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. <sighs> Said, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. That he did not thinking, he did not think, that title of being God was something to hold on to or to demand, I'm God. <laughs> you send somebody else down there. I deserve this. He did. He is worthy of every praise, every thought of adoration, every act of service to him. He's worthy. But he humbled himself. Who did he humble himself to? The Father, the first person of the deity. He submitted himself to him. Did he have to? No. He did it. They came for him in the garden. There was a whole slew of them, not just a handful. There's hundreds of them with spears and knives and sticks coming for him. And he says, who are you looking for? And what happened to him? Anybody know? They fell at the very sound of his voice. And he goes on to say, no man took my life. I surrendered my life. I gave my life. Pilate says, don't you realize 
I've got the authority to let you go. What did Jesus say? You ain't got diddly unless it's given to you from above. He submitted and humbled himself. God, who Isaiah saw him high and lifted up, sitting upon this throne, surrounded by angels, declaring holy, holy, holy. They were doing it then and they're still doing it today. Holy, holy, holy. Thousands. Ten, I could have called 10,000 angels. Surrounded by that. In glory, in splendor, in majesty. He deserves to be there. But he surrendered. <laughs> Took that off. I do this, I minister some, to some kids from Central America that are here illegally and we go and teach them every week. And I kind of kiddingly, and I hope not irreverently, bring this to their mind. But I like to, to get them involved in thinking about it. I don't know if you've ever given much thought about what heaven is like. But what do you think it smells like? The Bible doesn't, to my knowledge, say anything about how it smells. I'm just asking, what do you think it smells like? Good or bad? Sweet or sour? What do you think? Clean. Clean. However it smells, beyond my comprehension, it's got to be good. Okay? So, the, when he absolved himself he did not give up his deity but when he left his position of adoration there in the heavenlies and took upon flesh the last thing he smelled was that whatever it was good what's the first thing he smelled what <laughs> everybody hear what she said I can't repeat that where was he born he was laid in a manger, but he was born in a stable. We call it a stable. We think of that old barn back in the backyard. It's more like a cave. I don't think there was much ventilation. And there was packed full of animals because there was a whole bunch of people in town. And anytime I've been anywhere with a bunch of animals anywhere, it smelled like what she said. So that's just, I mean, that's just something silly to, to kind of toy with our mind. But that, he gave it up. The last thing in his angels, 10,000 angels at his beck and call. Please, Lord, call. I'll do whatever you want. Just, just give me the, oh, Lord, you're so worthy. Holy, 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 holy. In the brilliance of glory, in the mutual love and admiration of the deity. He began there in a stinky barn. And then commenced to living amongst us. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then there's some time period of his life we don't know too much about, but we know what happened toward the end. How he was treated, rejected of his family. Ultimately falsely crucified. Treated disgracefully. Planting on his head the thorns. Pulling his beard all the different things. Said, once again, what's the gospel? How he died for our sins according to the scriptures. And the scriptures they had then was the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament. It's all in there. It's all in there. I, I challenge you sometime to, to read Psalms 22. Psalms 22. But read it all the way through. Don't just read the first of it. Read it all the way through. Because it w begins with something that probably all of us or most of us are pretty familiar with. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Did you ever hear that before? Where is that? <coughs> Where? On the, cross. On the cross. Now, I understand in that moment on the cross, nothing about his metabolism changed. I want you to understand that. Yes, people think some pretty crazy things about him because the Bible says he became sin. Nothing about his metabolism changed. He was still the word in flesh and sinless. He became our sin offering. He took upon us, not his sin, our sins. That's what they do in a sacrifice. They put their hands 
I put my sins on you. Now kill it. That was the sacrificial system. My sins are on you. Kill it. So that's what he did. And he cried out, my God. There was a, not a ceasing to exist, a unity with the Father. They were still one. That's why I say read all of Psalms 22. But the fellowship, the fellowship that was so sweet in the eternity past. So sweet in the eternity past. Uninterrupted. Total, complete love, glory, mutual adoration for just moments. I don't know how long, but that was the fellowship of the Father and the Son was broken for me, for you. He took the beating, didn't cry out. He took the crucifixion and didn't cry out. But in that instant of separation, he cried out. A sense of abandonment. He cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But so I say, read the rest of Psalms 22. Because in the Psalms, at the end of it, tells us, there was not a doubt in his mind that he had been forsaken. He knew he's God. He knew what was coming. He said, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the sufferings of the cross. He knew what was going to happen. I heard a Filipino, a Filipino missionary say this one time. I can't disprove it, and it makes pretty good sense. It says, back in this day, and we have examples of it with Jesus, where you were called upon in front of the synagogue or the temple to read, and you would read it. You didn't know what it was going to be before you got there, and you would get up there and you would read it, and then you would expound upon it. You tell what it meant. And he said what was taking place up on that cross. He was experiencing this fellowship interruption. But he was preaching. Who was walking around him out there? Who was all, as he looked down from the cross, who was there? Well, we all were. But I'm talking about physically on that day at that time. Who was down there? Were the Jewish leaders there? The scholars of the Bible? Yeah, they were there. They were there. His, some of his disciples were there. Most of them took off running. But the Jewish people were walking by and spitting on him and mocking him. And, ah, oh, you think you can uh, restore the temple in three days? Get yourself off the... They were making fun of him. They talked about it in Psalms 22. It's in there. And it literally happened just like that. And so when he cries out, My God... My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Somebody. They were scholars. They knew it. They sang those songs. Those were, they knew that was their songbook. They should have heard him. My God, my God. Should have. Somebody's attention. I don't know. I just offered that to something to think about, to ponder. <sighs> that fellowship was broken. But that's his plan. It's an eternal plan. Before the foundation of the world settled forever with the deity that we know as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The very fact that we know him as Father teaches us something about what he wants us to consider him, not something distant and far off. He wants that father-child relationship. And Ephesians talks more about the adoption thing. We don't have time to get into that, but it's there. So there's a plan. There is a God, exists eternally. You're going to have to stand before him one of these days. And you're going to be judged by this book right here. He has a plan. That is provided. This book is it. It does not tell us everything about God. But it tells us everything that God wants us to know about him. He's not going to come up on that day of judgment. And put this book aside. And says, but I got this other book over here. Forget what that book says. I, it's not going to happen. It's this book. You're going to be judged by the word of God. By this book. And this book tells us everything about this God of grace and mercy that we've been singing about this morning. It tells us how we can obtain that grace and mercy. You're saved by grace through faith, not of works, not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. He did it all. 
whatever was necessary for us to have those sins that we were talking about erased and forgotten forever, he took care of it. His blood. Nothing. What can wash away all my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that's in there. We are all in his plan. If you receive him, if your eyes are open and your heart is open and your understanding is open and you reach out and grasp hold him and hold him and clutch to it with all your being and put your faith in him, not in anything of yourself, but have faith in what he did on the cross, God on the cross, those sins can be forgiven, wiped away. But if you should say, no God. This book talks about you too. The fool has said in his heart. Some translations say there is no God. But I read somewhere once by some supposed scholar, maybe not. It literally says, the fool has said in his heart, no God. You're in this book too. You're in his plan. God has never taken pleasure in the eternal punishment of anyone. He calls all men everywhere to repent and believe and receive his sacrifice. But it'll be no surprise to him. He's already got your name in the book. (laughs) This is one thing I personally discovered about God. I was raised in a Christian home. It was a Church of Christ home. And I had all the information up here. And every time the door was open, the Cooper family, would there were six kids, and we'd in the door like ducks, and we were there. When that door was open, Monday, Sunday, Wednesday, whatever it was, we were there. I've got pictures of me in class with a little gold crown for memorizing the verse. I had all that stuff. I had all that information. I knew all the stories. I didn't have the hero of the story, but I had the story. And from the time I was 13 on, I ran as far away from that as I possibly could. I didn't want any part of it. But now looking back, I can see times. Though I didn't want him, he was on my heels. I heard, I think it was Chuck Swindoll called him the hound of heaven. He was there. (laughs) At different points and times of my life, you know, I'd be running whatever it may be at hit this wall and whatever it be, he's there. He's there. Right? (laughs) Here I am. Kept on and kept on and kept on. Until I was 27 years old. And I hit the final wall. (sighs) Surrendered to it. Not unlike Paul. Not as dramatic possibly as that. But it was to me at that time. To him. He's pursuing He's he's got your name down. He knows you personally. He's pursuing. I don't know how many opportunities he's given to you before, but he's given you one now. In my humble way of presenting it, it's not my presentation that makes the difference. It's why I emphasize somewhat lovingly and jokingly about the gospel The Bible said, this word says, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Not my eloquence, not my knowledge, not my presentation or clever way of doing things. It's how he died for your sins according to what this book says. And that he was buried and he rose again on the third day according to what this says book says and the God of this book planned it that way says if you place your faith in him that way to whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life but who that does not believe verse 18 of John chapter 3 is condemned already not someday you're good against your bad and you hope the good's better Today, this second, you're already condemned. You're under the condemnation. And verse 36 says the same thing. If you believe in the Son, in the name of the Son, you have eternal life. But he who does not have Son, the wrath of God abides over you. You're one breath away 
from the punishment of God. But it's not because he didn't give you opportunities. I had countless opportunities. But still he pursued. Still he pursued. Still he pursued. Praise God he pursued me. He's given you an opportunity this morning as we prepare for a a verse of response. The Bible says, Whosoever believes in him, that Jesus is the Messiah, has been born again, uh, has been born from above. Uh, uh, Ephesians 1.13, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, speaks about, says, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed you were sealed. Same difference. What does that teach you about this gospel. When I heard it. And I believed it. I was sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Until the day of redemption. But you got to go through. Newcomers class. <laughs> I say that jokingly. I can look at different religions. And not meaning to be mean to them. This is what they believe. In the Catholic church. You are brought into the church with the sprinkling of the water in a type of safety, but it's not salvation. It's in the the protective care of the church. And then later on, at confirmation, you receive the Holy Spirit. That's their teaching. It's not mine. It's their teaching. But even then, to say you're saved eternally is not a good thing with them. I was raised a church of Christ, which, man, they... Bible drills and things like that, man, they got it down. They know the word. And they teach, you've got to repent and you've got to believe. But you come into the water lost. And you come out saved. And you can still lose it. You don't go in with the spirit, but you come out with the spirit. From what I see what the Bible says right here. When I heard it, I believed it, I was sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. What about my sin? Yeah, I'm going to. Yeah, I'm going to. But it's covered. It's under the blood. I want to discern sin less and less, but I am not sin less. But I do want to sin. I'm not what I used to be. But I'm not what I'm going to be. He's working on me. He's working on me. He worked. As the musicians come. And we prepare for a, an opportunity. Of response. <sighs> Hear it. Believe it. Sealed. I'll be more than glad to pray with you. And I'll be more than glad to pray for you. But we are saved by believing. We are justified by faith. When I hear it, I believe it, I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The question is, not if you've joined a church, not if you've been religious, not if you've conformed to some type of spirituality according to man's thinking, The question is, and it's going to be the most important on the day of judgment, what have you done with my son? What have you done? Have you put your faith in him? You can believe in God and go to hell. That's a hard thing to say, but it's in there. John 3, 16. John 3, 18. John 3, 36. If you do not believe in the son, the wrath of God abides over you. Respond in this opportunity if there's a need to for anything as we stand and as we